Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 29, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our view of the single most important step to preserving the PFD and where the two remaining candidates for governor stand on the issue. Second, some suggest the Alaska budget is on its way to recovery as a result of new oil developments on the North Slope. We discuss why that isn't the case. And third, once again, we explain why state legislative races are so damned important to the PFD and the Alaska budget. And now, let's join Michael. Every week, Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budget comes on board to talk with us about what is important in his mind, and according to Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, what should we be paying attention to? And uh, that's uh, that's where we're at this morning. We're going to be talking with him about his weekly top three, and you know where does it where does it all go from here? And uh, we start off this morning with him. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. I hope you are as well. You know what? No complaints. No complaints. We were just uh, talking a little bit about the snow. I will admit that I was a little depressed yesterday when I looked outside and saw it. I was hoping for just a few more days reprieve before we got all the white stuff. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Maybe it'll melt down one more time before it gets here permanently. So we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, I can, it's sort, sort of like oil prices, right? Just give me one more good day. That's right. Just give me, Just give one, me one more spike in oil prices, and I'll, and I'll use it right this time. Right. I plan, what was that? Give us one more oil pipeline. We promise not to piss it away. That was the old Alaskan saying. Um, well, let's, so let's talk, uh, let's talk about your weekly top three. Uh, of course, all of these things usually have to do with state budgets, politics, and things like that. Um, and we're now, of course, focused in on the governor's race. Your number one uh, for your weekly top three is talking about the effect uh, on fiscal policy and the debates that are going on right now between uh, Dunleavy and Baggage. And you're saying that the, the changes are becoming more and more, I don't know, is it imperceptible or are they getting more aligned? What's what's happening here? Well, I I don't think they're getting more aligned. I, I, I think um, the, the, the fact that the, the fuzziness of what they're talking about is, to me, is getting more concerning. Here, here's there was a great article in the uh, Anchorage Daily News yesterday uh, about that, that focused on uh, what the, the headline was. Here's what the two major candidates for Alaska governor want to do with a permanent fund dividend, and it was it was a good article. Uh, summarizing the positions of the two candidates on 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 how they would calculate the dividend uh, and how they would uh, how they would approach the dividend uh, if they were elected and and how they would intend to proceed through that uh, with the legislature uh, baggage focus, focusing on constitutionalizing Dunleavy focusing on you know returning to the uh, statutory PFD. Uh, that's been ignored by the governor, by Governor Walker, and by the legislature the last uh, the last three years. But what really what I'm what I'm concerned about is this: um, there's one critical component to making the PFD work, and that is having a budget that works. The, the problem we've had the last three years isn't so much that there wasn't enough earnings in the permanent fund. 
uh, earnings reserve or that the permanent fund wasn't producing enough earnings or anything of, of that nature. The problem was the budget didn't balance. And when push came to shove, first the governor and then the legislature decided to use PFD cuts as a way of dealing with the budget issue. And in fact, last year, uh, in the passage of SB 26, um, Senate Bill SB 26, uh, started by the Republican majority Alaska Senate, uh, the legislature sort of made it worse by by permanently uh, in that legislation, uh, not defining PFD was going to be and sort of leaving it to legislative and gubernatorial whim uh, year on year. That the the the, the the concern about that is if we don't have a fiscal plan, if we don't have a budget that works, that's exactly, regardless of what of what these guys say running for governor, that's exactly what will happen year in and year out going forward. We will have a budget that doesn't balance, uh, and the pressure will be to find, the, the necessity will be to find new revenues, and the pressure will be to use PFD cuts, use the PFD and cuts in the PFD, as a way of, of balancing the budget, that will be the first step that the legislature, or at least some legislators, will go to. So to get the PF to get the PFD secured, to accomplish the objective that they're talking about, um, uh, both of them are now talking about in the campaign. To get the PFD secure, you have to get the budget secure. Uh, there has to be a fiscal plan that works that that doesn't rely on additional revenues uh, coming in from PFD cuts or, or an, a, an undefined additional source of revenue uh, in order to make the budget work. You have to have the budget working inside itself, <clears throat> balancing inside itself, uh, in order to secure the PFD. And my concern is, and, and I think a, a good concern brought out in the article, uh, if, you, if you read through it and you're looking for what's the fiscal plan that makes the PFD secure, my concern is we don't have that. Right. Uh, uh, Mike Dunleavy's budget numbers, I mean, he talks about the PFD, he talks about restoring the PFD. All those are good uh, goals, but to achieve that goal, you have to have the step of having the, 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 the budget balance. And, and Dunleavy's conversation since late in the primary campaign uh, has really failed to uh, identify a fiscal plan that gets the budget balanced. He talks about cuts, but when he's pressed on cuts, uh, he he only cites a very few that that really won't have that big an effect uh, on on bringing the, the the budget back into balance through cuts. Baggage talks about talks about taxes, uh, income taxes, but he's got to get that through the legislature and. And there isn't an appetite, let's be clear, there isn't an appetite in the legislature for income taxes. So right. you've got two guys who are talking about fiscal plans that just don't work. Well, and, um, let, let, and for a second, Brad, I mean, let's go back to the let's go back to the uh, to the genesis of this. I mean, again, Dunleavy and, and, uh, and Begich is not saying this, but Dunleavy is saying this, that the that the. The whole problem with this thing it comes back to that fact that it is government spending that's causing this. Do you agree with that? I mean, do you agree that that government has been, uh, you know, spending too much, you know, in the overall and not focusing on things that are, you know, that are mandated and important? Or, or, uh, oh, go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. We've talked about this on the show uh, over the over the years. Uh, uh, how government has has spent too much is not reining in uh, uh, categories of spending that it could rein in uh, and kept spending uh, under control. And Dunleavy's right to be talking about that, but then when he talks about the overall budget that he wants to achieve uh, late in the primary season, as we've talked about on the show, he started talking about a $4.3 billion budget, which is more than half a billion dollars too high uh, to be able to achieve uh, the objective of getting the budget under balance based on traditional uh, revenues, paying back the, starting to pay back the CBR, uh, and being able to pay a, a full dividend. So he, he's, he's going down the right road in terms of the general uh, proposition 
But when you get to the specifics, his specifics just don't get you there. Right. And, of course, baggage specifics all have to do with uh, taxation, which, again, you've mentioned already that the legislature, and I think the people of the state of Alaska overall, don't have an appetite for. And it doesn't do the important thing, uh, which I think is uh, continue to put pressure on the legislature to shrink the size of government because it has gotten overblown. I mean, over the last course of the last uh, 15 years, and especially in the uh, you know the late aughts to the uh, to the mid teens, we saw a tremendous explosion in the size and scope of government. And I think uh, by starting to talk about these these escape mechanisms, these relief valves of new taxes and new revenues, we we don't focus on what's important, which I think is again focusing on what is mandated by the Constitution and reducing the size and scope of government to fix those things specifically. Yeah, exactly right. And and I, you know, I, I I I've sort of thought through. So we so we return the we get we elect a governor, one of these two guys. We return to the legislature. Um, uh, Dunleavy presses for for budget cuts. He's going to have to press for more budget cuts than he's talked about. The legislature resists that. Begich goes in, talks about taxes to provide the revenues to keep keep spending at the levels. We currently are, or even elevated levels, if uh, if Beggage wants to go that direction, and you're and you're faced with a situation where the, the left hand column of revenues doesn't match up to the right hand column of expenditures, and you've got a uh, and you've got a gap in there, and, and what closes the gap? There was a the Anchorage Chamber, the Alaska Chamber, was meeting in Fairbanks um, in their fall uh, uh, meeting last year. And Ed King was was chairing a panel or moderating a panel that had Senator von Imhoff, uh, Chris Birch, uh, Representative Chris Birch running for Senator Chris Birch, uh, and Steve Thompson on it, along with Tammy Wilson. And Ed Ed raised the question as moderator. He raised the question: uh, Let's say we've got a nine hundred million dollar uh, deficit uh, after all of the after all of the spending. Uh, is done and, and all of the revenues is taken into account. Uh, what do we do? Um, and, and both von Inhoff and Birch's responses, both of whom may be major players uh, in the Senate next year, both their responses are cut the PFD. And, and that's that's after a campaign where we now have two candidates who say they want to preserve the PFD. Right. But we have legislators who, who are going to be on the ground dealing with it. Who say that that their resp- that their reaction is cuts the PFD? So, if if we really want to preserve the PFD, the core of what we have to do is to get the budget in balance uh, and not rely it on on pulling uh, pulling additional revenues. Right. Um, but uh, but but when you look at when you look at where this campaign's coming down to, both candidates have that goal in one form or another. Uh, but when you look at where this campaign is coming down to, neither have a plan uh, that when you look at, at how you have to get that through the legislature, neither have a plan uh, that seems workable. So it's a, it's a somewhat disappointing situation to be this deep into the campaign, um, to be this focused, have been this focused on PFD through the campaign, and, and then to look at the key issue. Uh, whether you have a fiscal plan that's going to work without PFD cuts, look at that key issue and still not have still not have clear guidance from from candidates about how they're going to get there. Um, uh, you know, not only do the, do the people not have an appetite for uh, more taxes, Brian in the chat room says, I'm not sure the people in the state have the appetite for budget cuts either. And I do get worried about that because you've got large constituencies now, including uh, almost a quarter of a million people on one third of the state is on some form of Medicaid welfare, you know, uh, um, you know, healthcare programs. I think that you know this is going to be a fight from a couple different quarters, and I and I think it's going to be a difficult one in the long run. Yeah, and and if we and if we don't have an appetite for the budget cuts, and we don't have an appetite for taxes, and we get to the point where we still have a fiscal gap, uh, regardless of what the governor wants, uh, I mean, the governor can't can't add money back for for a PFD if the legislature doesn't appropriate it. Uh, regardless of what the governor wants, the default among among many legislators 
uh, still seems to be uh, PFD cuts. So we, we've got to fight on regardless of who's elected. I mean, we've at least got two gubernatorial candidates who are talking about the PFD as their goal, uh, maintaining, preserving, uh, 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 stabilizing the PFD as their goal. But we're still going to have a fight on our hands uh, after the election about, okay, so tell us now what your fiscal plan is to produce an environment in which the PFD can go forward. Uh, One final thing before we run out of daylight for this segment, Brad, and I know we want to get on to number two, but uh, I just had to comment on this. There's a comment in here by Larry Priscilli, who's a former uh, DNR commissioner, and I think is indicative of the attitude that we see happening in Juneau a lot. I'm going to read you the quote. It says, speaking as a long-term cynic and skeptic, I do worry, he's talking about a public advisory vote, I do worry not that the public doesn't have the right to vote, but I do worry about the public's ability to vote in the best interests of tomorrow. And again, this... <laughs> That kind of arrogance is, it, to me, seems to be so indicative of what's going on with our leaders and our politicians and our bureaucrats today that we are just children that are running amok and we just don't understand. I mean, if that's the case, why do we even bother to vote for anything if we can't vote in the best interest of tomorrow? We're putting politicians in there. Um, your thoughts on that as we get ready to leave this segment? Well, there is there is, there is Juno think uh, that the uh, Obviously, we run into during sessions where Juno becomes the center of the universe and the lobbyists are down there and everybody's sort of isolated and they they create their own bubble. Um, And they do convince themselves that only they – I mean, as Republican and Democrat alike, uh, they do convince themselves that only they truly understand the overall picture. Their their obligation is to lead and is to be an information source back to their constituents. It's ultimately up to Alaskans to make these decisions. Not, not to, uh, not to a select few. Yep. And if they think Alaskans don't know enough, then they should be taking steps to educate Alaskans, as opposed to just running roughshod over Alaskans. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Brad Keithley is our guest, and we're in the break. Ah, uh, Brad, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stretch it long on that, but boy, I just, I got to tell you. To me, I read that, and and I'm Persilli's never been one of my favorite people anyway. But that just kind of to me speaks to the whole problem with what we have with our with our folks in Juneau, the politicians, but especially the bureaucrats. You don't know; we know better than you how to take care of these things. And you children, you should just run along and play while we we adults in the room take care of the big stuff. Yeah, and we're going to run. I mean, so that's where we're. That, that's that's exactly what we run into when we come into session. That's exactly what we run into when 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 the legislators uh, go down to Juno. And I guess, Michael, I, my my point I'm, I'm I've been trying to make or I'm trying to articulate uh, this morning is we've not got it settled, and we've not got this issue settled in the campaign. We will have. We will, one of, both candidates are now promoting the, the PFD, are now saying they will protect the PFD. Um, we will have that as an aspiration, as a goal uh, on the day after uh, the election. Either candidate will have, in, in various forms, come out with that, with that aspiration and goal. Uh, but without a fiscal plan that balances, um, it, 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 we're, we're going to be right back in the soup when we go back into the legislature. And let me tell you, I mean, this this, this experience up in Fairbanks, this, con- this conference up in Fairbanks, right. let me tell you, we have we do not have legislators who are with the plan of saving the PFD. We, yeah. are, we are coming in with, a, with a, a raft of legislators who are going to take the same attitude they had in the same session, which is if something has to give, it's going to be the PFD first. It's sure as heck not going to be. You know, in the case of, of Republicans who re- represent wealthy districts, it's sure as heck not going to be my uh, my my constituents uh, paying an income tax. So it, it's we're, we're we're coming in with different players uh, in the in the governor's office. We're coming in with a, a different attitude uh, in that they're putting the PFD first, but we're not coming in with enough different facts uh, to make that an absolute certainty uh, as we go into uh, as we go into the next session. Well, we're going to have to. Hopefully, the electorate's going to make some uh, going to make some good choices here. Uh, let me go back to the uh, chat room. Uh, Harold says the race is tight. Dunleavy's lack of clarity has really bolstered Begich. 
um, which in some ways I agree. I think it's it's solidified his base a little bit more. They feel emboldened by the fact that Dunleavy won't come out. I think Dunleavy does have some details, but that he, again, is still holding them back, thinking that he can run the clock out. I think you're right. Before I think we talked about this before, he doesn't want to alienate um, you know, some of those middle middle of the roaders who are okay with government spending by going in and saying it's going to take a chainsaw to state government uh, and veto, line out and veto a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, based on my past discussions with him and his past actions in the legislature, that that could be what his plan is in the long run. Your thoughts? Well, it could be, but... But it's not. I mean, he he has done everything but say that in the, in 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 this campaign. He's talked about numbers that are not the numbers you need to have to be able to to cut it down. He's talked about examples of of cuts that are that are relatively minor, um, that are more consistent with his four four point three billion uh, dollar operating budget uh, approach. Um, so it could be that the old Mike Dunleavy, you and I have talked about, you know, what we need is the old Mike Dunleavy to come back. Right. It could be that the old Mike Dunleavy shows back up after, after being elected. But you're, but you're, you're hoping for that. I mean, you're not going into this, you're not going into the election or into the, into the voting booth knowing that that's what you're voting for. You're hoping that's what, that's what uh, happens. The old Mike Dunleavy comes back. So I, I, I would tend to agree with Harold on this. I think, I think Dunleavy's um, effort to run the clock out, not be precise, not not even not be precise, just be you know uh, sort vague. of totally vague. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, it's just vagueness at this point, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that I think that is hurting, um, and it may have it may have preserved some votes he might otherwise have lost. Uh, and maybe he's not going to lose votes that, that, that are with him in any event because they hope that the old Mike Dunleavy comes back. Uh, but we don't have a plan. I, I guess my point is we don't have a plan that comes out of this election that says how we're going to get from point A to point B. Point B is preserving the PFD. Point A is where we are now. We don't come out of this election with a plan for getting from, from point A to point B. Well, thanks so much for coming in and joining us. We're continuing our discussion now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on the weekly top three. We're a little slow. Brad and I have a tendency to be uh, have a tendency to be a little verbose. He and I could do a two hour show uh, every day, probably when it's all said and done. Uh, we're working up to number two, number two on the weekly top three, and number two has to do with uh, has to do. Uh, with um, uh, war, you know this North Slope, this new news on the North Slope about oil developments, and uh, what does it mean for state finances? And we're talking de- about developments specifically in NPRA. Brad, well, we've got great news uh, on the North Slope in terms of oil development. We've got Conoco committing to uh, additional, uh, substantial additional new projects uh, uh, on the North Slope on the western side of the North Slope. We've got good news with respect to Liberty's development or, or Hillcorp's development of the Liberty Project, uh, which is offshore of the North Slope. The, Fed, the federal government is is giving the the series of approvals that are necessary uh, for that to go forward. These are these are huge, significant dollar investments um, in the development of new oil, uh, which uh, which really are encouraging from the standpoint standpoint of uh, of, of Maintaining an, an Alaska oil industry and keeping uh, keeping Alaska uh, oil uh, uh, production levels at, at relatively at the high, at the rates that uh, that we've been experiencing not not continue to have significant declines. But there's a question. The question arose uh, has arisen about what does that mean for state finances? Dunleavy, for example, just to go back to our prior discussion for a brief moment, Dunleavy has has pointed to that develop those developments. As as one of the one of the things to look forward to, um, in terms of revenues and in terms of how we're going to work ourselves out of the state budget, he's talked about increased production levels, these new sources of production as a as one of the steps that are going to get us out of this problem. And and it's not true. Um, NPR A developments. There's a great article on this in uh, the Alaska Journal of Commerce. Elwood uh, Bremer 
uh, wrote a great article about a week ago that is anybody who's interested in this really needs to go back uh, if they haven't already and go back and, and read it. Uh, that dives into what happens to the to the royalty uh, money <laughs> into tax money that comes out of the MPRA development, right? Um, and, it, and and the MPRA and, and in MPRA there's an existing federal statute that says a portion of the royalty goes to the feds, of course, because it's federal lands. A portion of the royalty goes to the state, but of the state's royalty. Um, most of that has to be rededicated, is obligated by federal law to be rededicated to the localities from which the production comes, in this case, uh, the North Slope Borough. So the, the revenues largely, the, the royalty revenues largely, are going to be plowed back in uh, to the North Slope Borough as, from MPRA. And then the article goes on and talks about uh, production taxes uh, and rightfully works through uh, the, the the status of these wells that are going to be that are being drilled in MPRA uh, sort of analyzes their effect under under existing uh, oil tax law and says there's not going to be much production taxes uh, coming from these wells uh, as well. Here's the quote: We have to grapple with the issue that there is a bundle of great news, and along with that great news comes great expectations, and also at some point we have to talk about money. And what, right now, with respect to royalty the MPRA, the state is not a recipient of a significant amount of that. So at some level, we're hoping that we can work with the North Slope Borough. The state can levy this – is, this is on taxes – the state can levy oil production tax on MPRA projects, but the tax revenue will likely be relatively minimal for years given the multi-layered deductions companies are able to apply to new projects. So – when you think it, it, it's great news to have these developments on the North Slope, it's great news to have these projects going on in MPRA, and it's great news to have the, the Liberty Project moving forward. But as you think about these projects, you can't translate that, as you could in the old days with Prudhoe and, and other places. You can't translate that into a bundle of money coming to the state because because that's not, that's not the, the way that the statutes – that the federal statutes work on the on the royalty side, and it's not the way that the statutes are going to work uh, on the production tax side. Right. Well, and because primarily, I mean, in theory, any additional money that's not consumed, uh, this is from the article, any additional money's not consumed by the grants, the grants going to these localities, is split between state uses with 25% going to the permanent fund, 5% going to the public school trust fund, and the remainder going to rural power programs, with the last of it going to the general fund for infrastructure. But the problem is... There's never been any money left over from any of this stuff. It's all been consumed by the locality. So there is no money not consumed by the grant in the long run. And even though they're talking about larger amounts here, the boroughs are saying that they have programs and projects on the table for upwards of $400 million worth of projects. I mean, that's a half a billion dollars worth of projects. There's not going to be any money left over for the state. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right, and um, and and that's not. I mean, that's not anything the state can fix. That's that's by federal statute. That's federal law. That was part of the bargain uh, of opening up uh, MPRA to, to to further development. So that's. I mean, the, the North Slope Borough. You, you can look at it as as indirectly having some effect because state the state won't need to assist the Fort uh, the North Slope, Slope Borough. Uh, in in any significant respect, given the revenues that will be coming to it from this uh, from this source, but the state didn't provide much assistance to the North Slope Borough in the first instance, so that's not that's not going to be a whole lot of savings. I, the point is the point is people should not immediately trans translate uh, the kind of significant new oil development we're having on the slope. Uh, into, well, we're going to work our way, way out of this because we're going to have this increased production. It's going to produce the kind of revenues that we've historically had, uh, and we're going to be, with production going back up, we're going to be we're going to be sitting pretty again. That's, ju- that's not the way it's going to work as production starts coming from federal lands as opposed to what's historically happened is it's come from state lands. Right. And so although it's good news in the long run because more development begets more development, I think, in the long run, uh, and it shows the viability of a lot of these oil patches and things like that, 
unless we find a lot more than they anticipated and the demand for these projects and infrastructure and monies goes down on the North Slope, which I don't think it's going to, we're not going to see any significant amount of this money going forward. Right. And that and that gets us back to the to the to the first discussion we had, which is that's not going to save that's not going to be the savior for state finances. More revenues coming from these developments is not going to be the savior for state finances. So we, we have to face it. I mean, we have to make significant budget cuts uh, if we're going to balance the budget uh, without going to new revenues. Um, and, and we're going to solve the state situation that way. It, to put it off uh, or to, you know, to sort of say, well, I don't, have to, I don't have to deal with those budget cuts. I can have a $4.3 billion budget. To put it off and by, by claiming that, hey, all these oil developments on the North Slope are going to suddenly put us back, back into a lot of money. We're out, of the, we're out of the hole. Don't worry about it now. You, you can't say that. I mean, that's not reality. That's not, that's not where we're headed. The focus has to be on, on, on budget cuts, significant budget cuts, uh, to get us back into solid fiscal shape. There is not uh, – the, ca- the, the, the cavalry is not coming over the hill. Um, uh, to, to, to save us. All right, we're down to the last uh, couple, three minutes here, Brad. Why are the state legislative races so important um, to to this whole overall picture of what we're talking about here? Well, there's a theme this morning. And <laughs> the theme is we have to make budget cuts. Uh, it's not the feds. It's not, it's not production from federal lands, from all these new developments that are going to uh, – uh, going to save us. And so it's going to come back to the legislature uh, on how they're going to deal with this. The governor can't the governor can't protect the PFD by adding more money in uh, uh, at the end of the budget process to make sure the PFD gets gets paid under the Supreme Court's decision last year in the Wilikowski case. The legislature is it, treated as an appropriation, and the legislature sets what the appro- appropriation limit is. The governor can veto, but he can't add more money on. So it's going to all come down uh, uh, as, as, as we go through these steps over the next few months. It's all going to come down to the legislature in, uh, in how they deal with that. As I said, you know, two, of the, two of the likely senators in the Republican majority have already said, well, if it doesn't balance out, we're going to do PFD cuts. The only way we're going to change that answer is to have significant, uh, significant change uh, in the legislature. And, and changing the governor isn't going to be enough. Changing the governor is important, but changing the legislature is where we have to make uh, these decisions uh, uh, in, on Election Day yep. uh, if we're going to hope to get the state's fiscal situation back in shape. Couldn't agree more. I mean, the governor can veto all he wants. He just can't add monies back into the budget. And if uh, the legislature is already, as you've shown with this Chamber of Commerce thing, uh, willing to go to uh, cutting the PFD, he can't put it back in. So it's definitely going to be a, a tough thing. Brad Keith, we're clear. Brad, as always, my friend, thanks for uh, thanks for thanks for coming on board. Any final thoughts for the Facebook audience before we let you go here? Yeah, I, this this is <laughs> this is sort of the ultimate culmination of it. What in the legislature has to change? Um, and there's two seats, I think, that frankly are going to control where we end up uh, on these issues. One is District O, Peter, uh, where Senate, uh, Senator Peter Machecki is currently the incumbent, uh, has a challenger, Ron Gillum. I think a change in that race uh, could be a, a, is a, is an important, necessary step uh, to get the legislature under control and, uh, and to start getting spending under control and to preserve and protect the PFD. Frankly, I think the other... Uh, uh, key legislative race is Senate District A, which is Scott Kawasaki and Pete Kelly. And while there's things not to like about Kawasaki, a lot of things not to like about Kawasaki, I think on on the PFD issue, he will take the steps. He's more likely to take the steps to preserve the PFD uh, than Pete Kelly is. Uh, Pete's shown that that his knee-jerk reaction uh, is just like uh, Von In. On and uh, and Birch's, which is uh, to cut the PFD first. And if that's if if we have him back in the legislature and we have Machecki back in the legislature, I 
I think that's frankly where we're going to end up. Um, so what do you think of those two seats, I think, is important. What do you think of and, and I agree that the Senate is the key. But on the House side, what do you think about the idea, again, of Vance and Weatherby and Ben Carpenter? Your thoughts on those three races as well? Oh, they're all they're all important. Changing the House would be very important. There's there's issues in the House uh, uh, in the House as well. Uh, and they certainly could be a, a problem. But the House is probably more easily resolved, more, the deals are more easily made in the, in the House uh, to, to maintain the PFD than they will be in the Senate if we have the same Senate players b- uh, back, uh, back in the Senate. So I, t- to me, the Senate is the key. The Senate's been the problem all along. They were the first ones. They were the first movers to cut the PFD. They, if you look at the major bills to cut the PFD, they all have S's in front of them. They've all been Senate bills. Um, and and getting the Senate in, in a position where the true fiscal conservatives, we've talked about this on the show uh, before, the true fiscal conservatives are, are the balance of power. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, that's a key issue uh, to, to, keeping, to resolving this issue going. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. Michael, again, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.